Hello lovely people, I'm Kay3N and welcome to week 14 of our Slow Stitch Along for 2024. Um, and I'm very well aware that for many of us it is Easter Monday, so all those who celebrate Easter, happy Easter. Um, I did think about going with Easter as a theme, but I decided not to um, for reasons I'll talk about as we, as we stitch along. Um, what I wanted to explore this week was the concept of layers, of layering cloth together and stitching through them and very much exploring the, the feeling of stitching through those layers. Um, and the theme I've chosen to go along with this is the moon. Um, again, for reasons I'll go into while we're, whilst we're stitching. One of those reasons that led me to um, uh, fly to the moon, so to speak, was because that l last week we did friendship stars. So stars and moon, you know, uh, a match made in heaven, <laughs> pardon the pun. Um, and friendship stars were taken from a traditional quilting design, well they are a traditional quilting design, um, that were given in the pioneer days by women to their friends and loved ones who were maybe going on a journey away from them. Um, and often the name of the loved one was stitched into the star and then that was given to them to carry with them. And I've seen many, many beautiful stars and many stories of friendship um, on social media in the private Facebook group. If you're not a member yet and you'd like to be, you know where the link is down there. Um, please do join because it's lovely. Um, and on Instagram and in the comments here. Um, and somebody in the private Facebook group, a lovely person called Uni, mentioned in passing, oh, wouldn't it be lovely if all these stars could be joined into a quilt, an actual quilt. And someone else then said, another lovely woman called Alice, um, well, it could be done digitally. So, <laughs> without much thought, apart from, oh, that sounds wonderful, I did a little post saying, does anybody have the technical skills to do that? Because I certainly don't. And the wonderful Deborah Williams, um, who's up in South Yorkshire in England, volunteered for the mammoth task of collating hundreds of stars into a virtual quilt. Now, I had to put a deadline because I wanted to share it today. Um, and deadlines are not something that, you know, we normally do with slow stitching. It completely goes against the grain. Um, but I wanted to, to show it this week and share it. So all those of you who were not included because either you're not in the Facebook group or you are in the Facebook group and, you, you know, you weren't able to finish your star on time or whatever, please be assured that the, our virtual quilt that I'm going to show you in a minute represents all of us, whether your star's actually in there or not. Um, so I'm going to put that up on screen and then um, we'll go along to my desk and uh, get into this week. So thank you so much for the friendship of all of you. It's a really lovely community we've built here. Um, and yeah, I, I, I just, I love you all. Thank you so much. So here's the Friendship Star Quilt as collate, as stitched by members of the private Facebook group, representing all of us here in um, this community and collated by the wonderful Deborah. Enjoy. Okay, so first of all, I'll show you um, various entries in various sketchbooks, and then I'll talk through what you need, if that's okay, because I know some of you like to pause at that point and go and gather your supplies. Um, so, like I said, the moon has been a theme for me for, you know, a long time. <laughs> um, so in this one, this is the journal that I made um, when we first came back to France in 2017. And um, I started it on the, the full moon, which in the northern hemisphere was the harvest moon. And just to show you here, this is something you could do if you do any tea dyeing. All I did with this little piece of cloth, I'll hold it up, which was um, just, you know, commercial blue and white striped cloth. That's actually the back of it was I clamped, um, I think it looks like a, maybe a two pence coin, so a coin, some kind of, you know, disc, with um, a bulldog clip, and then I tea dyed the cloth. So I dipped it in strong, strong tea maybe for an hour or so, and then I took it out and took the clip off. And so the, the coin has formed a resist. So you've got the, you know, the tea dyeing around here, and then the middle stayed, more or less, it seeps in a bit. But that's maybe something you could play with. And then I just stitched it with running stitch to the background cloth. So that was my little harvest moon. Um, 
uh, then in this one, it's coming in from the left. I've marked the page. Oops. Uh, this journal's got all kinds of different size and shape of page. This is maybe something I'll I'll do at one point as a as a video. Um, it's interesting to work in a journal like this because you have something. It's not just a blank page. You know, you can kind of be inspired by the flip outs and you know a book within a book. They do get really really fat. <laughs> I mean, a normal a normal journal gets fat. Some of you have already commented how your your stitch journal for this project is already fat a quarter of the way through. Um, but for me that's something to be embraced. Anyway, I'm rabbiting because I'm <laughs> looking for my moon. Uh, here we go. Yeah, so this was um, a similar process to the, the tea dyed one I just showed you. Um, this was cloth that was rust printed and I then put a bigger disc on it. It looks like one of my pot menders and I put it in my indigo vat. So, you know, you, you need indigo for that, but you could replace that with um, any other kind of dyeing, you know, any other kind of dye that you wanted to use. Um, but I wanted to show you this really not so much for that piece, but for this little thing that I wrote. And I think I might use these words in the, the new, you know, the journal I'm working on now. In case you can't read it, I think you probably can, but I'll read it anyway. This is from um, 20th of January, 2019. Wolf, why do you howl at the moon? asked the sun. Her light moves me, replied the wolf. But she has no light, said the sun. She only reflects mine. Oh, said the wolf. Oh, oh, oh. So yeah, it's it's kind of a serious metaphor in there somewhere, but it is also a slight word joke on my part. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I liked it, so I think I'll write that. You are free to write it, of course, if you want to. Um, I share it willingly with you. Um, I also, as always, say that you can do you and write your own uh, write your own version. Um, so I better leave that mark so I can find it again at the end. I think I can probably remember it, but one never knows with one's brain. Um, and in this book here, this is, uh, we might do a version of this later on for something because I, I liked this as well. But this is cloth weaving. But instead of the difference, you know, the strips that we used in week one for community, I cut into the background cloth, you know, in lines within the circle, and then I wove strips through. So it's slightly different. And then I stitched, um, can you see the seed stitching here in almost crescent shape? So that's another representation of the moon. And here I wrote, the moon, a constant presence, even when unseen. And that was in the th on the 30th of December, 2020, I wrote that. Um, so that's that moon. But the one I want to make again, and I don't often remake things, but I, I loved this when I did it. Um, so I thought I'd do it again with you all. And it's a version of this. Um, <clears throat> now this is a moon with the wolf. I love wolves. I've always had a, you know, um, a love for wolves since for as long as I can remember. I've got my wolf stump in my woodland. Um, I've heard wolves in wildlife parks howling, you know, it's and also obviously on nature programs and so on. But I've never been lucky enough to be in the presence of wolves in the wild. There is talk that there are now wolves in France. Um, and there's a lot of controversy around that, as you can imagine. But anyway, um, my wolf's going to be made of cloth, so he's not going to cause any controversy whatsoever. Or she. I think we'll have a she-wolf. Um, so this is a simple piece of layers of cloth built up, basically, of different shapes. So that's what we're going to look at today in terms of techniques, um, you know, creating layers. So. That being said, I shall set that to one side. I shall leave that there just for a minute in case you want to screenshot or pause or, you know, anything of that kind. And I'll show you how I'm going to create that today and what we'll need, firstly. So I'm going to start with a foundation piece for my layers. So I'm going to use this bit of um, dark purple, which is quite frayed and I frayed it even more but it's very soft and it's very open weave. You can almost see my hand through it. If you didn't have purple, of course, you can use any color you like. I just thought the night sky and all that. Um, 
but the the fact that it's soft um, and you could also do the needle test because I'm going to have four or five layers by the time I'm finished you know it needs to be really nice to needle through and then onto there I had my wolf on the piece I just showed you running on a, on a strip that sort of went across behind the moon so I've got this piece again it's a bit of old sheet um, that's been dyed I think this is by me with Procyon many, year, many, many years ago. It's a scrap. I don't praise, haven't Procyon died for over 12 years. Um, but anyway, I thought it was nice with the purple. So that's my next layer. And you could then again, if you really wanted to, then check. You know, it's still nice to stitch. It's so important to me. Um, and then my moon. Many of you will have this. I sometimes feel a bit bad using all my eco dyes because I have people saying, "Oh, I don't, you know, I don't do eco dyeing, and I love it." And you know, others like to use a different palette. That's fine. But anyway, I know a lot of you did the rust and tea dyeing following my video, and I've seen that a lot of people do have this. So um, I thought if I pick a little area of this, this is linen, but it's quite soft, and it could just as easily be cotton. Then I've got my <laughs> my handy template, also known as a roll of masking tape. The marks in the tea dyeing, if you sort of choose an area, maybe there, to me look a little bit like the surface of the moon, you know, the craters and the mountains and all the things that are on the moon. So I'm going to draw around that and have a circle of that, quite big. My piece is just shy of um, 5 by 7 because that's the size of my journal. Obviously your piece may differ. Um, and then I want my moon to sort of be quite dominant on it. So if that's my template, that's my moon. And then the last layer, so now we've got one, two, three, uh, three layers. And then the last layer will be the wolf. Well, it won't be the last layer. The last layer will be the stitching. Um, the next layer will be the wolf. And I've, I'll show you in a minute how I draw. So you'll need a scrap of paper and a pencil. Um, you see, it's very rudimentary. I'm sure you're all capable of drawing a wolf or whatever animal you choose. And I've got this scrap of, it's um, a bit of old shirt. It's, it's got something in it that's not cotton. You know, it is mostly cotton, but it's got something else in it. Um, but I like, quite like a black she-wolf on my purple background on my moon. So basically, that's what you'll need. So you'll need a backing fabric, um, a little strip of cloth to go behind your moon for your, your, wolf, to, your wolf or whatever animal to run along. Um, a moon cloth, let's call it, and then another piece for your animal. And then you'll need um, applique pins if you've got them or any pins. Um, oh, and I've also got this. This is another layer which may, I may or may not um, use. I'll see. This is some a black chiffon scarf that I had a long time ago from a charity shop. I thought of maybe putting that over the very top, not stitched down, just at one side to represent a lunar eclipse, which I'll talk about as we go along. So if you happen to have some black chiffon or some kind of very sheer cloth, you might want to grab that as well. Um, and then threads, I'm just going to use probably just a, a neutral sort of beigey colour. Um, look at my thread tin. I'm all in keeping with the theme, you see? Um, so I probably will take something like that. I don't want really the stitch. I want the stitching to give texture, but not necessarily colour. Um, all sorted because I got new threads in my trip to England. If you saw that video on Friday, um, <clears throat> so that's what you need: and a needle and some scissors and a pencil. Did I say a pencil? So if you want to pause and go and get that and come back, I'll be right here. Welcome back. <laughs> that was obviously seconds in my world, but maybe you paused me. Okay, so. Um, I've got those two already to the right size, so let's the next thing, let's get the circle, the moon. I'm just going to use a regular pencil. So apologies if my head or wisps of my hair come in while I draw. I don't want to go too much in the middle and waste. Well, it's not really wasting, is it? I'll always use the scraps. Let's go, let's go where, where I think it's the most moony, moon-like. Quite like there. And I think I'm going to do... Yeah, around the outside. I could go around the inside and have a small moon. But, you know, just make a decision, Catherine. I'll go around the outside. I'm just going to draw around it and cut it out. Simple as. You see, a, a regular pencil, if you use a, a, a soft one, works fine. You don't need all those fancy um, 
fabric marking pencils and things. So I'm just going to cut that out. Now I'm not really worried if it doesn't come out perfect. In fact, my roll of um, masking tape is probably not a perfect circle because the moon is not a perfect sphere. So it's not even that we're embracing wonky. We could almost say we're being scientifically accurate. When you do any kind of cutting, I'm sure many of you know already, especially if you're journalism, used to working with paper, but the same applies to cloth. It's handier to keep the scissors moving straight and turn whatever it is you're cutting. You get a smoother line. Also, I mentioned in my harvesting clothes video that I wasn't going to use my good scissors because of the elastane in the cloth. Just a little note, if you've done any rust dyeing, the same applies to rust dye cloth because no matter how well it's rinsed and neutralised, there might be still some vestiges of iron that will blunt your good scissors. Um, and I had lots of lovely tips from health, helpful people about how to sharpen my scissors, um, all of which I've tried at one point or another in my life and I never find they really work um, very well. So I, I'm very protective of my good scissors because they're expensive. Um, if I get them sharpened, I'll get a sharpening person to do them. Okay, enough wittering about sharpening scissors. Um, so, layer, layer, moon on top. I could use either side. Hmm, I've got another decision to make. I think I'll stick with that side. Um, I'm just going to pin that all together, and then I'm going to go and show you how I did my wolf, which is very simple. And just, you know, I have just eyeballed it. If you want to, I've put it in the middle, if you want to put it one side or the other. If you want to measure so it's exactly straight and in the middle, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I always say that, but it's so important. If you want to be accurate and that's what makes you happy, then that is still slow stitching. Slow stitching is not... And I always get this slight hectoring tone in my voice when I say it, I'm sorry. <laughs> slow stitching is not about being deliberately messy if that's not what you like. Right, so that's my moon pinned, pinned on. Um, and now for my wolf. Uh, I cut the template out to save time, but I have drew it again on here. So I think if I hold it there like that, if you want to copy it, you can screenshot or just pause your screen. And I have, in the past, with a very soft pencil, traced things directly off my screen of my tablet. Um, you know, like it's a light box. But go very lightly with a very soft pencil. You don't want to damage your screen. So that's him. Uh, but I just drew him. If you want to do a different animal, you could Google something like cave paintings or folk art or something like that, and then you'll get these more, you know, primitive... It's almost a the essence of a wolf rather than a realistic wolf. And I did his feet like that because that makes him she. We're calling him, we're calling her she, my she wolf. Um, that makes her look like she's running. So just to give some movement. So all I did was draw that on a piece of paper that was about the same size as, you know, where I want her to go so that I made sure I got her the right size and then I cut her out. Okay, so that's just a cut out version of that. So I'm going to pin that onto my bit of old shirt with some applique pins, you guessed it. I, I could draw around it if I had a, a white pen, but because my cloth is black and um, I don't have a, a white pen or pencil that will show up on cloth, I'm going to do it like this. And I don't mind if it's not accurate, as long as it looks something like it. You could, of course, draw around or, you know, do whatever it takes to get yourself your animal out of your cloth. <laughs> I'm just showing you the way I'm doing it. Oops, don't want that pin, it's far too long and it will bite. These little legs are going to be a bit tricksy. But we'll do our best. Right. Okay, I'm going to pin that one down, but I'll start there and be careful. I'll start at, the, I'll, actually I'll start at her nose. So I'm just going to cut her out. Now this shirt cloth, because it's got, like I said, elastane or something of that kind in it, is trying to slip and slide. 
um, but I'm just holding it. You could also, on the wrong side, if you wanted to, use a glue stick to hold your template down while you um, while you cut. But I don't really like to put glue in my stitching unless I have no other choice. Another thing you could do if you're um, if you have freezer paper, which I did used to use, but I don't anymore. But if you do happen to have a scrap of freezer paper, you could draw your design on freezer paper, your animal, and then iron it onto your cloth, and then it will stay put while you cut it out. But um, the last bit of freezer paper I had is long gone, and I don't, like I said, I don't um, I don't buy it anymore. Sorry, it's really hard for me to see the the black cloth from this distance. But when I've cut this out, it's bound to be all raggedy. I'm sure you know how to cut out. Do excuse me, I'm going to move it closer to me because I can't actually see. Um, if it's unpleasantly raggedy when I cut it out, I shall just go around and give it a trim. Like I said, it just has to be... Um, something in the region of what I drew. You could even, if you wanted to, just draw, if you're confident, just draw directly onto your cloth. Or even, if you're even more confident, you can just cut out, draw with your scissors kind of thing. Just cut out a shape of an animal. And I'll be very interested to see what other animals people might choose. Whoops. That's going to be really tricksy to get into there. I'm making all kinds of little tiny bits, but they'll go in the scraps and they'll come in for collage. So. Oh dear. <laughs> Maybe I should have tested this first. It's really slippy. Anyway, I should persevere. Keep it real. Keep it real, people. to the tail and the back should be easy because that was cutting around all the legs that took so long. Oops. And I completely forgot and Alison remembered and asked me if I'd got scissors. Hello Alison. Um, because I said when I'm in England I'm going to get myself some new little sharp fiskers. And I completely forgot, but even if I had got new ones, I don't think I would be using them on this elastane shirt. I have, by the way, put a needle through this black cloth to make sure it's nice to stitch right. So let's take the pins out and see how she looks. I'm not going to do any turning under or, you know, a plique or anything like that. I'm just going to, to my mind, it's an art piece and, um, oh, it's not too bad at all. Do I need to do any trimming? No, I think it'll be fine. Now in the other piece I had her running to the right. I think in this piece I'll have her running to the left. So now you could make a decision whether you, um, stitch you could stitch all that now first and then put your wolf on over the top um, or you could put the wolf directly on and then you know do your background stitching what I did in that other piece and of course I've now lost the page where is it what I did in this other piece I should have kept the page marked I don't even remember it wasn't that journal even it was journal um, was I stitch, I put the wolf on. Where are you, Wolfie? Is that it? No. I put the wolf on and then did the background stitching. I can't even find it. Shout out if you remember the date I said. When I say shout out, I really wish I could hear you. One of these days, when I have Decent broadband. It would be lovely to do a live session so we can actually interact live. No, I can't find it. Anyway, I'll tell you. Um, I put the wolf on now at this stage and then I did my background stitching and stopped at the wolf. 
Um, I think I might do my background stitching first and then put the wolf on, just to be different, just to see how that process makes me feel. So I'll just give myself some room. So I think I'm going to do invisible baste just to get the pins out. I think I'm just going to baste around the edge of my moon and I might come a little bit up into here. Um, it was interesting to hear Marion on Marion's World talking about the invisible base. She called it prick stitch and she remembered her mum doing it when she was doing tailored clothes to hold layers together, you know, like when making a man's jacket with lining and so on. But I think it's always interesting when you take a, a tool or a, a technique or, you know, something from one, what it's designed for or what it's invented for, whatever you want to call it, and then you see an application for it elsewhere. Right, so now we stitch. Um, I'm going to, I think I'm just going to go around the edge of my moon about somewhere between an eighth and a quarter of an inch away from the edge. Let's get rid of that scrap of paper. Um, with the invisible base, which um, unless you're new here, and in case you are, I shall tell you, there's a tiny back stitch on the surface of the cloth and a longer stitch on the back. And it's a kind of basting or tacking stitch that you don't have to, to remove afterwards, it stays in. If you use a toning thread, you see there are, well you can't see <laughs> because it's invisible, <laughs> there are two stitches there. But just so you can see where, you see where I'm coming out there, I'm just going to go back maybe two or three threads of the cloth. And it's just a means of holding all the layers together, getting rid of the pins, and then you've got your little constructed, what I call a back cloth. And you can go do your fancy stitching without worrying about pins. And it does as well, although the stitch itself is invisible or virtually, virtually invisible, it does give a kind of texture to the piece. It begins to unify the layers, you know, particularly when we've got multiple layers like we've got here. <coughs> so whilst I'm doing this, I just want to tell you a story. Of course I do, because I, when I was in England, I stayed in um, Wiltshire which is when I when I lived in England, I lived in Somerset, which is next, you know, a county over. Um, but when I visit, I stay in Wiltshire because I have a friend who lives there, who always very kindly puts me up or puts up with me or both. Um, and people from Wiltshire are known as moonrakers. So you see the relevance to what we're doing this week. And why I want to tell you the story. Um, now this comes from a legend, which there are many versions of it, but I'll go with the one that I know, the one that I've been told, and the one that I believe is the most commonly told, um, which is that in the town of Devizes in Wiltshire is a pond called the Crammer. And in the 18th century, Wiltshire was on the smuggling route from the south coast of England to the, you know, to the more inland bigger towns where smuggled goods could be sold. And a great deal of the smuggled goods invariably were barrels of alcohol of some kind. So I'm going to just break off and I'm just going to go a little bit into the, the rectangle of, you know, that's sticking out there and then come back. Um, so the story goes that one one night in the late 18th century, when the moon was full in the sky, two gentlemen with a cart pulled by a donkey were um, taking some barrels of brandy through the town of Devizes, when the donkey suddenly had a, had a spook and wouldn't budge. And so the men tried to, they were quite mean to the donkey, let's leave it there. But anyway, the donkey rebelled at this meanness and kicked out his himself out of his harness and, um, you know, the, the, what do you call those long sticks that come off a cart, you know, those things, and ran away. And in all this commotion, the cart tipped over and the barrels of brandy rolled into the crammer, which is this pond, like I said, in the town of Devizes. Um, so the two gentlemen got in a bit of a state because that was their precious um, brandy. 
Uh, I'm just going to come back onto the, my moon and carry on round. Um, so they got into a bit of a state and they managed to find somewhere in a nearby outbuilding a couple of rakes. So with these rakes they were trying to retrieve their barrels of brandy. Well at this point they heard the approach of horses hooves and it was an excise man and an excise man was the, employed by the crown like customs and excise today to um, catch these ne'er-do-wells who are smuggling brandy and, and so forth and thereby um, you know cheating the crown out of the crown's due taxes. Anyway so it's an excise man coming and your two old Wiltshire chaps are with their rakes trying to get their barrels of brandy out of the, the crammer, the pond. So the excise man says uh, what have we got here then, what are you two up to? So the two um, Wiltshire men, being very canny and smart, start talking in real yokel accents. Yokel, if you don't know, is an English word, and it, yokel, it's a, like a local yokel. It means a real sort of country type in Wiltshire. They talk a bit like that. If there's any Wiltshire people watching, I do apologise <laughs> if I'm doing more Devon or Cornwall or Somerset. Um, but anyway, so they said, oh, you see that in there? That's a great big cheese, that is, and we're trying to get him out. Now, of course, it wasn't a cheese. It was a reflection of the moon that they were indicating. But the exciseman, being, you know, a bit of a snob, probably, thought, oh, bless, you know, stupid country yokels don't know any better. They think it's a cheese. So he just laughed and thought, idiots, and rode on his way. Um, but of course the laugh was on him because when he'd gone, the two Wiltshire chaps managed to retrieve their barrels of brandy, track down the donkey, hitch him back up to the cart and um, went on their way. <laughs> so that's why Wiltshire folk these days are proud to call themselves main rakers <laughs> when they put one over on the excisement. Right, and that story has got me round nearly. Oh, I'm just going to go round here as well. And in fact, when I was teaching in England, the local quilt group in that part of the world is called the Moonrakers. And um, my very good friend Wendy was, I don't know if it was the chair or she was, anyway, she was in, uh, an active person in that group. I'm not sure if she still is, actually. I have to ask her. She's in CQ West with me. Um, anyway, I've been and taught that quilt group, the Moonrakers. And that, in fact, was when I first learned about the legend. Right, so I think now I'm just going to simply get my neutral coloured thread and do some stitching up and down. You, of course, can do whatever you like, as always. Um, I must say that this has been very nice to stitch through so far. Do try it out first you know, your layers. Don't start using batiks and things like that. <laughs> They're not nice to hand stitch. Well, you know, they're probably doable in a small area, just one on their own. Um, and I can say this combination is nice, but that's with my needle. Your needles might be different. So you always have to sort of try with your own, with your own tools. Just trying to find, talking of needles, a slightly bigger one. That's too big. Oh, where about? Oh, there it is. That one will do. <clears throat> so, I'm going to use some of this, which is, what is this? Oh, this is anchor thread, so I must have just got this. It's just, you see, it's virtually the same colour. I'm just going to use two strands. It's going to be naughty. I've probably pulled the wrong end. There is a correct end to pull in a skein of thread. Um, and it's okay, it's just caught up. Now, I'm pulling off way too much. I'm going to cut it slightly shorter because I know that it makes me wave my arms about and makes the camera go blurry. But always when I'm sewing, you know, just sitting on my own, I always pull off too much thread because um, there's that triumph of hope over experience. You know it's going to tangle, but you still hope that it won't. And you don't want to have to keep stopping when you're in the, in the zone, in the flow, in the rhythm of your stitching to re-thread. And I've talked about this in an earlier video and a person in the comments told me 
think it was her mother, that that someone who did that, there was a, a phrase for it. It wasn't a lazy stitch or it wasn't anything that simple, but it had that kind of connotation to it. Now, I can't find it. I've looked back where I thought it was and I couldn't find it. If you're that person or if you know of a very specific term for a stitcher who knows better but still pulls off too long a length of thread, could you please tell me? <laughs> because it's really bothering me that I can't remember. So I'm just going to make a knot. And I'm not going to applique this down or this down. I'm just going to do, I think, some vaguely diagonal. I'm just going to start somewhere and start stitching and see what happens. And I'm going to go through the, the background and the moon together. Just because, because. Um, and um, yeah, I would lo I'd love to know what the, what the correct term is for someone who's silly and pulls off too much thread. And I hope I'm, I'm trying to put my hand to one side, so I hope it doesn't blur. Um, now, while I'm doing this, I want to talk about running stitch. Because I sometimes have comments, not negative comments, questioning comments, nothing wrong with asking me questions, um, about why don't I do other embroidery stitches. Because I mostly do running stitch. Sometimes do a bit of seed stitch. I might do an odd French knot. I might do a cross stitch or a bit of blanket stitch or an eyelet stitch. But I think probably 90 plus percent of my stitching is running stitch. Um, and if people ask me about embroidery stitches, I um, send them to Marion <laughs> because she's brilliant at demonstrating many, many different embroidery stitches in a very understanding and understandable way. Um, but, you know, I, I've, I've learned all those stitches over the years. I, I, it's not that I can't do them, I can. I've had very kind people recommending ways I can go and learn. <laughs> um, I just like running stitch. In fact, I love running stitch. Uh, I love the rhythm of doing it. And as you know, for me, the most important thing is the process. I love what it does to the surface of the cloth. Um, I love how you can play with, there's so many things, it's not, you know, you say running stitch and that's the end of it, no. You can play with the length of your stitches, you can play with the length of the spaces between the stitches, which is obviously the length of the stitch that you're making on the back. Um, you can play with the direction, so here I'm doing vaguely parallel lines, that's something I will talk about again in a minute as well, the parallel lines. I can play here about when I'm looking at this line of stitching, when I'm doing this line, if I matched up the stitches to each other, I'll get a completely different look to if I, for example, put my space on this side where the stitch was in that line, and my stitch on this side where the space was in that line. Um, I can play with the dif distance between the lines, you know, I can have them close together, further apart, I could wiggle in and out. I can take the running stitch for a walk over the surface of the cloth, like I did on my eyelet stitch piece, which I showed in my eyelet stitch video. Um, I can change the colour of my thread. I can change the thickness of my thread. I could do some running stitches with, say, three stand strands of floss. So I nearly always use two, but I could use three strands of floss, and then I could go back over and use one strand in the same colour thread, and that would give me an effect. Um, are you getting the idea <laughs> that running stitch is not boring um, for me, and it's not boring to do, and um, I just love it. I can play with the direction of the stitch, so I can do some stitching this way, and then I can come back this way, and then sometimes the stitches will get crossed, and you'll make little serendipitous crosses. Um, <clears throat> so I don't do running stitch because I don't know <laughs> any other stitches. I do it because I like it. And um, I'm really thrilled if you like it as well, and I'm happy to explore it. Um, and obviously, if you like to do other embroidery stitches, you find that more interesting and pleasurable to do, then you do you. As I'm not saying you only have to do running stitch. There's no having twos going on here. No shouldings. I'm just explaining why that is mostly what I do. Um, to all those kind people who... Um, you know, have commented in a helpful way. 
what I'm feeling now here, where I've stitched, even though I've only done two lines, is the, the structure of the cloth changing. It's getting substance. It's still soft, but it's getting a kind of substance to it that the stitches are giving. And that's why I said that although here I've currently got one, two, three layers, the stitching is a fourth layer, the wolf will be a fifth layer. Um, so now, in terms of... Um, oh, yes, one more thing. I said about when you're cutting the cloth that had the iron in. Well, I've got it here, I'll, I'll mention it. This cloth, as I demonstrated in the tea dyeing video, it was left with the rust and iron for no more than 24 hours. And it was then neutralised with um, bicarbonate of soda in solution. And it was washed then with some grated natural soap in the washing machine um, after, after being rinsed very, very, until the water ran clear. So there is no metal left in this cloth. When I stitched through there, where you see the, the rust colour, that I felt no resistance whatsoever. There's no difference in the hand of the cloth there. Um, I, when I said about the scissors and the iron, it's, it, we're talking about microscopic. Now sometimes if I've rust dyed cloth, I can feel the iron still when I stitch. For example, the bundle books that we've all buried, you know, that we're going to open on the, sol on the solstice. Those, if you've put iron in, will not be really suitable for stitching into, or only in a careful way, avoiding the, the metal. Um, the, the key to minimising the amount of metal that's left in your cloth when rust dyeing is one, to not leave it too long, so 24 hours, and two, to neutralise. The science on that is a bit iffy, but I don't think it can hurt, you know, as to whether it actually achieves anything. Um, and three, and also importantly, not to let it dry out. Because that's when bits of rusty metal will shear off and, you know, get embedded in the cloth. And that's really not nice to stitch. And the cloth's, you know... The, the cloth is visually nice and interesting. It depends what you're going to use it for. But I wouldn't then use it for stitching. OK, so I've come to the end of where my little strip go in that, my, my pale purple strip is. I don't think I'm going to come off the edge of my moon onto this backing cloth. I think I'm going to stay just on it. <clears throat> you see, about an eighth of an inch from the edge. Um, I don't know why I made that decision, but I did. I shall have a think about it and tell you if I have a reason. <laughs> it's very possible that it wasn't a reason. Oh, probably to keep the clean edge of the moon against the dark purple. I don't know. I don't know. But it is interesting to examine your decisions when you make them and ask yourself why you think you did that. <clears throat> um, the other thing that you may notice while I'm stitching is that I very rarely take more than one stitch at a time, unless I'm piecing. Uh, uh, it's just the rhythm I like. It's also not wrong if you prefer to load your needle up with several stitches and then pull through. Um, I can see here that, did I mention when I was talking about all the possibilities with running stitch? one of the other things you can play with is the tension you put in the stitch. So here I'm not putting much tension, I'm just letting, you know, I'm just pulling the stitch through until I feel a slight resistance and then I stop. But if you pull it through more, you see I've quite exaggerated it, you get these ripples. So you could do that as well, maybe not that extreme, but just play with your stitch tension and look at how it affects the surface of the cloth. And um, you know, that's something else you can do with the humble running stitch. Uh, I said I was going to talk about my, my lines and parallel or not. I read that a lot in the comments here and in the Facebook group. People stressing over their lines being straight and parallel. If it bothers you that your lines are straight and parallel, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with finding ways to make sure that they are. But try not to let it bother you, is what I really want to say. Um, there are ways, obviously, you could draw lines to stitch along. I'm not a great fan of that because I, it takes something away from the process for me. You're kind of, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, I'll try. You're, you're following a drawn line. I mean, I know when I was doing machine quilting, I tried to not let people do that. Um, 
but with machine quilting there's a specific reason why you're stitching over a drawn line by machine which goes quicker um, and you have less control. If you go off the line you kind of jag, you make a jaggy movement to get yourself back on which doesn't really apply to hand stitching. Um, I could use the word organic, I could say it's more organic if you're not dead straight like a machine. Um, but um, yeah, there, there are traditional, when we made Kawandi I talked about how city women use their thumb as a spacer, but my thumbs are quite fat and <laughs> I don't really want my lines to be that far apart. Um, I just go by eye and see what happens, but then maybe because I've done I don't know how many miles of running stitch in my time, my lines are, you know, practice has made me straighter. If you've got a piece surface, like a collaged surface for example, or you know, some other kind of piecing, which has straight lines within it, like, like your Kawandi for example, you can use the edges of the patches as a guideline when you're stitching. So it's much easier for the human eye to eyeball a consistent space between two points that are closer together, if you see what I mean. Um, you can of course just stitch one line and then use that line as your reference and then the subsequent line and so on. Um, and that I guess is what I do. In terms of distance apart, I'm going to show you in a minute because my distance is not consistent. That was quite hard to say. I'm not going to say it again. <laughs> my distance varies, let's put it like that, and come through to the back and end my thread. Um, but because I do heavy, heavy stitching, a lot of it, um, it's there's an analogy that I like. If you have a choir of people, when I was at school I did a lot of amateur dramatics and the whole school was encouraged to get involved. So if you have a choir of people all singing together, if one or two of them, uh, you know, couldn't carry tune in a bucket, shall we say, it doesn't the overall effect is still tuneful. Do you see what I mean? Whereas if you ask one of those people to sing solo, then their lack of vocal skills will be more noticeable. It's the same with stitching. Stay with me. Um, if you just make one simple line of stitch, you will see if there are discrepancies in the spaces and so on. If you make two lines of stitch, you will see that the lines are not completely parallel. But if you do lots of lines of stitch, it becomes an overall thing, which you would be able to see if I didn't keep waving my hand over it. Um, but I will show you that, do you see here, I've gone really close together. With this line here, I'm really far apart. Do you see? I'll point with my, I'll point with my pencil. This line here, I'm really far apart. And if it bothered me that I was too far apart, I might go back and put another line through, but then they'd be closer together. So I'd have to ask myself, which do I prefer? Do I prefer a big gap or do I prefer to put another line and have two smaller gaps? I might use that as a design opportunity and take a slightly different colour of beige and stitch that through there. You know, I might say, oh, there's a little space opened up for some stitching. Let's, let's throw in a line of a darker beige. There's many things you can do. The one thing I nearly never do is take my stitching out. That's personal choice. If you, if it really bothers you, it's not wrong to unpick. Do unsewing. Um, but I find it a little bit. Well, it certainly interrupts my flow. Um, and I'm going to try and endeavour to get two strands off at a time. I do do this when I'm alone. But what I do is I put the other end in my mouth, and it's quite hard to do that and talk at the same time. Um, so it might go wrong. You need three hands or the help of a friend, or do it properly and take one strand off at a time. It's not really quicker to do it this way. Sometimes it's just you like the challenge. No, don't do that, that's not going to work. I'm going to put it in my mouth. Excuse me. There we go. <laughs> nearly, nearly there. <laughs> oh, what is she doing now? Oh. Oh dear, and I broke the end. Well, see, that was silly. It would have been much, much better to um, take it off one strand at a time. Yeah, so what was I saying? I was talking about not unpicking. 
So you can add that to the list of things I don't do, ironing. Although I did iron last week. You are all witness to the fact that I got the iron out and ironed my Manx log cabin. My Manx, no, sorry, mustn't call it a Manx log cabin. It's not what it's called. My Manx quilt. Um, and I did something else in that video that I don't normally do. I ironed and I, what, what was the other thing I did? I can't remember. I do, I do remember I had to unpick something in the previous week because I sewed a light strip where I should have been sewing a dark strip. Right, come through from the back and carry on. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to say something else about the moon. Uh, now, full disclosure, I have not yet filmed the introductory part, which I normally do first. Um, when you know when I'm sitting and talking to you face to face, so to speak, um, because I am filming this part on a couple of days earlier than it's than it's due to go up. You know my slow internet, blah 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 blah. Um, but I haven't filmed the introductory part yet because I want to talk about in that introductory part the Friendship Star project um, from last week. Which is another reason why I went with Moon this week as well. By the way. You know, from the stars to the moon, seem to make sense. Um, but it is a little bit disconcerting for me. Hopefully it won't be for you, because you'll see it in the right order. That what I'm filming here, what I know I'm talking to you, and I haven't... I'm trying to imagine in my head what I might say <laughs> in the previous bit, whereas for you, you'll already have heard it. It's so strange, this, this video-making thing. I know some people do film the doing and then film the introduction because I see them showing what they've made in the introduction so they must have done. Do you see what I mean? Um, but I usually like to film it in the sequence that you see it. Not, you know, only because it makes more sense to me that way. And I can't even remember why I started saying this and when I go and watch this back when I'm editing I'll see why. And if it was really important, that's why you get my little messages on the screen, which I know many of you don't see, because once you know what you're doing, you're stitching yourselves and only listening and not watching. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, so why I chose the moon. Um, I probably will have Will <laughs> in the future, but will have for you. said something about it in the introduction. Uh, but I wanted something on this, when the video goes out, it will be April the 1st. It will be Easter Monday. Some people celebrate or mark that day. Um, April the 1st is also, for some people, April Fool's Day. So I had many different options for themes that I could have gone with. Um, I went with the moon because... Um, oh, it's also, you know, all those associations with Easter that aren't necessarily within the um, traditional religious um, uh, rituals and celebrations are in the Northern Hemisphere to do with spring and new life and all that, which for me, I felt I would be excluding all our lovely people who live, well, it's not down under, cause they're, but that's what we say, isn't it? That there's no up or down in space, is there? Um, but, you know, in Australia and New Zealand and Tasmania and all those other countries, I'm still making that <laughs> making that movement and putting them down under. Um, but, yeah, it's totally arbitrary that north is up and south is down. Anyway, I didn't want those people to feel left out. We're all talking about spring and they're all going into... or well, you are, because you're watching and listening, I hope. <laughs> you're all going into autumn. Um, but the moon, the full moon... We see everywhere on the earth, we see the, full, the same full moon. Now, a full disclosure, many of you probably already knew that and are going like, duh, Catherine, obvious. I mean, I, I, know we, I know we don't have a moon each. I don't mean, I'm not saying that. There's only one moon on this planet. Other planets have more than one, but the earth only has one moon. Um, I'm not saying I think that we've got a different moon to people in the southern hemisphere. I'm not that daft. No, what I mean is the phases of the moon. You know, how we see the moon relates to the light of the sun and the position of the earth and so forth. 
So when we see a crescent moon or a full moon or no moon, you know, all that is the same in both hemispheres and the same moon, just to be clear. Um, the interesting thing, well, there's a lot of interesting things, but um, if it's a crescent and it's in the southern hemisphere, you see the crescent going that way to the right. In the northern hemisphere, it's going that way to the left. So it's a mirror. I learned that. Interesting, interesting. So I went with the moon because um, we've just had a full moon, all of us on this planet. And um, the full moon determines usually or more often than not when Easter falls. So I'm not ignoring Easter. I just didn't want to go on with the full Easter theme, you know, because not everybody um, celebrates, not everybody is the same. And I'm trying to be as inclusive as, as possible, you know, and not get into, you know, not, not, not alienate, that's a too strong a word. Not leave people out, let's put it like that. So I thought, well, if we celebrate the full moon and also celebrate the fact that we're all under the same moon, we all see the moon the same. Because so I know the constellations are different, going back to stars um, in the different hemispheres. Um, but yeah, I did wonder if, you know, may maybe it's the opposite. Maybe when we have a full moon, they have a new moon. But, you know, I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know. I don't know all the things. So I went and looked it up. You know, librarian. I know how to look things up. <laughs> I know how to Google, basically. But no, I, I know how to Google and I know how to filter the information that comes up when I Google, which is maybe the most important thing I learned in my studies. Um, so there are many, many different myths and legends and associations with the moon. The moon obviously and that science controls our tides um, and the moon, without the moon balancing the earth it would be a very different place because the earth wobbles a bit as it rotates on its axis and the moon's gravity, although that's much less than the earth's gravity, um, balances the wobble so that it's sustainable, you know, for our climate. Um, so we literally wouldn't be here without the moon. And I've always, always loved, and that's why the words that I wrote in there um, resonate with me, that the moon reflects the sun's light. And I did some reading as well about uh, different legends around the moon in different cultures, because in many cultures the moon is deemed feminine and the sun is masculine. And there's all kinds of theories as to why that might be, you know, the light of the sun is strong and powerful and all that, and the moon's more gentle. I'm not going to go, yeah, whatever, but I just did. <laughs> um, uh, and you could make great feminist treaties on the moon reflecting the sun's light, and if the moon's feminine. But what I also have discovered is that in some cultures it's the other way around. And it's pretty even split that, you know, if we're going to ascribe gender to planetary bodies, if that's even, you know, worth discussing. Apparently, I think it is. Um, but in, in some, in Norse mythology, for example, it's the other way around. The moon is masculine and the sun is feminine. Um, in the French language, it's le soleil for the sun, masculine, and la lune for the moon, feminine. So... I think maybe there is some relation to, I read, I read a theory that it's to do with what kind of climate you're living in. If you're living in a, a cold climate, um, then the moon is feminine because that's at night time when it, and when it's cooler, when it's cold. I don't know. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think I can be jet lagged from going to England when it's only an hour's difference and it was a few days ago, but I'm feeling a bit jet lagged. <laughs> Maybe jet lag's not the right word. Probably just tired because I, you know, did so much gadding about when I was over there. Uh, anyway, the moon. And then there's, of course, the lunar landings. Lunar landing, there's only been one. It's quite amazing to think there's only been one. Um, but 
Charles Armstrong. Sorry, Neil Armstrong. <laughs> Catherine. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and oh, who was the third chap? Three men, wasn't it? John. Oh, it's gone. You're all now shouting at me. No, it's gone. I'm not even going to bother putting it on the screen because I know you're all shouting at me. What the third chat was called. Who landed on the moon. Right, I'm just about going to squeak this last line out of this bit of thread, I think. Maybe one more stitch. And um, snip. Then I can use my third bit, which I broke, but only the very end. Just need to do a bit more here. I don't know whether I go back in there or not. Sometimes, if my thread runs out a bit before I finish. I just leave it, you know, I don't go back. And maybe it's laziness, <laughs> I can't be bothered to just go back there to do a few more stitches. Um, well, not laziness, not, not being able to be bothered, you know. Um, but sometimes I think it's just letting something be how it is, rather than perfecting it by filling in the gap. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. Right, so I'm just going to do these last few lines and I can now really feel the substance in the cloth. So I hope that if you are doing the same thing that I'm doing at this at this moment that you're feeling the, the difference in the structure of your own cloths. So I hope that's not going blurry. Sorry, I was waving my arm about in a... I think if I go off to the side like that, it's okay. But I've got my too long bit of thread. So... I'm having to do that. <laughs> this bit of vintage linen apron is quite slubby. You know, it has slubs in it. <clears throat> I will be very interesting and in interesting. No, I'll be very interested to see what other animals you might choose. And um it's just to clarify, it's always, you're always welcome to, you know, do what I do, use my words, use my ideas, obviously, my, my colour choices, everything. Oh, I mean, that's maybe obvious, but that's why I'm sharing here. But also, it's maybe less obvious, you're also welcome and free to take what I do and put your own spin on it entirely up to you and you might one week want to do exactly what I do and another week you might want to do something completely different. It's, I just hope that there is enough scope in the things I'm choosing to share that everybody can find, you know, find a way that gives them pleasure. I know there was a couple of people that struggled with the friendship star because of the, you know, the piecing aspect of it. Um, and I suggested here and there maybe just cut a star out on a plea gate on. I wish I'd said it that in the video, but I didn't, so... If you haven't yet done your star because you don't like the idea of piecing it, then feel free to do an applique version. And by that I mean just cut a star shape out of a bit of cloth and stitch it onto another bit of cloth, which is basically applique. I don't mean, you know, fiddle about with turning edges under and getting neat points, unless you want to. Okie dokie. I think this is my last line. And then we can get the she wolf in. 
and see how she might look on her little moony runway. One more stitch and I think I'm going to leave that because I left that. So now I've sort of made a feature of it. Okay. And my Wolfie. And French for wolf is Lou. Um, there's a French word for she-wolf, but it's escaping me for the minute. Maybe it'll come back to me. Um, French for werewolf is loup-garou. I do know that because there is a game that I've played about the loup-garou. Oh yeah, I'm liking her on there. I've got this black. Um, you could easily use, you know, just a piece in cotton or an embroidery cotton. But because I didn't have any black embroidery cotton, this is vintage darning cotton, I think just to do my applique. Okay. I think I'll pin her on. Yeah, there's a game called the Lugaru, Le Lugaru, I'll try and do a French accent, where you all sit with your eyes closed and I'm trying to remember, I've only played it once to be honest and it was a while ago. Um, and someone's been, it's like a murder mystery type thing, you know? And someone's the Lou Garou and you don't know who. And then the, the person running the game goes around and whispers in everybody's ear or touches people on the shoulder to indicate certain things, you know. It's that kind of game. Anyway, it's called the Lou Garou, the Werewolf. And I've played it once and it was great fun. With, you know, with some French people, <laughs> unsurprisingly was actually a friend of mine called Cecile who I've not seen for some time but she's um, she's a horsey person she does horse training but in the in a um, natural horsemanship type way what they call a th an ethological way in French right I'm looking for my needle there we go no, that one will be too fine I'll use the same one get rid of that sorry I keep hearing myself keep tutting it is a bad habit of mine I'm noticing all these habits of mine when I'm seeing, watching and listening to myself. It's very exposing, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm becoming aware of all these little things that you never knew you had for the nearly 59 years that you've been on this planet. <clears throat> but luckily you're all very kind. And you don't seem to mind that I have foibles. Right. So I'm just going to stitch all around the edge of my wolf with a little overcast stitch. I'm going to start somewhere here on along her back, I think. So I'm about an eighth, sorry, it's black on black, the very worst. I'm about an eighth of an inch from the edge. And I'm just going to take a straight stitch into the background, which is the moon, and then come up a slightly further along, somewhere between an eighth and a quarter. Okay, so a straight stitch into the moon and then up just an eighth of an inch in on the thing I'm applique. And this is technically raw edge applique. Um, I just like the look of the straight stitch. You could equally do a slanty stitch if you like that better. Have to be careful here with a little pointy ear that I don't trash the cloth. Go down, I'm just going to do a, a chicken stitch as we're now calling it. So that I didn't, you know, mess a little ear up. So I go in in a straight line and then come up a little bit further along. So I'm just going to stitch all the way around like that. And there's no reason why you have to do this kind of stitch. If you're doing a plique, you could do any kind of stitch. You could do a running stitch an eighth of an inch in, you know, around. And then you'll have a real raw edge showing. You could do cross stitches, you could do blanket stitch. Do any number of things. 
and I'm just keeping it simple. Um, oh yeah, let me talk about my bit of chiffon, why I thought of that. When there's a full moon, um, it's because the earth, the sun and the moon are in a certain alignment so that all the the whole face of the moon that faces the sun is in the light. I'm not explaining it very well, <laughs> you know what I mean. But then at one point the earth passes between the sun and the moon which forms a lunar eclipse as opposed to a solar eclipse. You know the solar eclipse is when we're all told not to look directly at them and people get special glasses and or special devices. Do you see there I came up, sorry, into the background cloth and I'm now going down into the top cloth and that is in fact what I should have done for the ear because then you're much, much I think when you're going down into the cloth if it's uh, a delicate point like that you're much less likely to damage than if you're poking around from the back. Sorry, interrupted myself just to tell you that. Um, yeah, so you, then you get a lunar eclipse because the Earth is blocking the sun's light from the moon. And at certain times of year, this turns the moon sort of a blood red, you know, you get a blood moon or I think there are other names for it, a rose moon if it's pinky coloured and so on. Um, but this March the 25th that we've just had, I, I looked it up and it wasn't such a spectacular lunar eclipse. It was, um, the moon was barely different, and if anything it was just a slightly sh um, darker shade of grey. So anyway, I had the idea of putting a bit of chiffon over to symbolise or represent the lunar eclipse. But again, you don't have to do that if you don't have anything suitable. Let me get that pin out. Oh, I went in a bit much there. Never mind. It'll be all right. It'll do, pig. But yeah, I'm really pleased with the way that rust print is doing duty as the surface of the moon. And I also don't think I can go much further without mentioning Pink Floyd. <laughs> I think many of you are from my generation and will know the album to which I refer, The Dark Side of the Moon. It's an iconic album in its day. And because the moon orbits in in kind of a, a dance with the earth would be the romantic way of putting it. But in in not in unison. Oh dear. I'm really really struggling with my words today. They don't rotate in unison, but the, the, we always see the same side of the moon because of the way, you know, the earth spins on its axis and the moon spins on its axis. And there's a word, and you're all shouting the word at me, I know, but um, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, the side of the moon that we see is always the same side. There's always a side that's dark to us. If any of you have ever seen the film about Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks... That was quite some time ago, but I think we watched it recently. Maybe it was on at Christmas time or something. Um, and then in order to get the Apollo 13 back to Earth, I don't know how true to life the film was. I'm only talking about the film, not, not you know, reality. Um, they had to slingshot round the moon and go round the dark side. I do remember the woman in the film who played Tom Hanks' mum when they were out of radio contact and everybody on Earth was obviously very worried about them. Um, the, the woman who played Tom Hanks' mum was, was, had friends and family sitting with her and they were watching on television. And uh, they were obviously concerned that she was worried and getting upset and so on. And she said, was he called Jimmy, Tom, the Tom Hanks? who Tom Hanks was playing. 
If they could get a washing machine into the air, my Jimmy could fly it, she said. So it was lovely, mother, mother's faith in her son. Hasn't Tom Hanks had such a variety of roles in his life, in his acting career? You know? Um, Woody, <laughs> Toy Story, the voice of. Forrest Gump, of course, that's a wonderful film. Um, there's the one when he's on, is it called Castaway, when he's on a, an island and his plane crashes. And there's another one where he's a pilot of a plane, I can't remember what it's called. Um, Philadelphia, of course, it was a groundbreaking film. I seem to remember a story when Tom Hanks was on a chat show in the UK. It might have been the Graham Norton chat show. Um, when he was he was telling a story about how whilst he was making Toy Story, he got into trouble. I think it was maybe it was, say let's say it was when Toy Story Two was coming out. Um, he got into trouble because in an interview he he did spoilers, you know, of what was going to happen in Toy Story 2. He said things he shouldn't have said. And apparently the producers of Toy Story 2 phoned him up to tick him off, to give him a telling off. And I think he said they almost threatened him with, you know, some kind of permanent thing, like the sack, you know, not the sack, but something like that. And he said, I'm Woody, what are you going to do to me? <laughs> So that was funny. I mean, you know, it's naughty to be naughty and say things like that. Of course, naughty Tom. But I did think it was funny as well. I must look that story up because I'm not entirely sure of my facts. Um, but it was something along those lines. That his riposte was, I'm Woody, what are you going to do to me? But then, you know, nobody's indispensable, are they? Okay, so I'm just going around my wolf's little feet. A little paws. And I'm really enjoying stitching into this surface of layers. And that is something to consider, the idea of layers of cloth. We we looked at it a little bit the week we did diversity. Um, because one of my influences was Cantha, Cantha, which is with a K, K A T, K no K A T. I'm spelling my name now. K A N T H A, um, which is the Indian tradition of layering up worn cloth, often saris, but not always. Um, layer, make, you know, putting several layers together and then doing long lines of running stitch, parallel lines of running stitch through to hold all the layers together and create a, a new usable item. But, you know, a quilt or a cover for a, um, or even rugs or a, you know, a thing, a useful thing. And so much so that you hear many people refer to parallel lines of running stitch as canther stitching. You know me, pedant that I am, I would like to insert the word inspired always. Um, but yes, when I was talking about cantha, I talked about the layers. And in Kawandi, we had a little bit the same idea because you ha we had the backing cloth, which is again made using old um, saris traditionally. We had the backing cloth and then we put, well, I put one piece of worn cotton sheet in the middle. Um, in my Kawandi that I made, as a lap quilt, I put two pieces of worn because it was very worn, there were holes in it even. Um, and there's something about stitching through several layers that is different to stitching through a wadding, a backing and a batting. Um, no, sorry, a backing and a top. A wadding or a batting. You know what I'm saying. Help me out, people. Tell me you know what I'm saying. You know? So here I've got 
um, I have to keep counting them, one, two, three, I've got four layers of cloth plus my layer of stitch. In fact, technically I've got two layers of stitch. And a four or five or, you know, if you put several layers of thin cloth together and stitch through them, it could be five or six layers even in a, in a canther quilt. It's completely different to the two thin layers and one thick layer of a traditional quilt as we know it in the West. And that is maybe something for further exploration. Um, examining how it feels to stitch through different different arrangements of layers, if that makes any sense. And what difference it has on the finished cloth. I do know that my can't my Kawandi, which doesn't have wadding in, I do know that there is a lady in Tasmania, I'm sorry I can't remember who it was now, who <laughs> said that she put wadding in in her Kawandi and I had to come and tell her off. So I said, put, put the kettle on, I'm on my way. Um, sadly, I wish I could just zap myself over to Tasmania because I've never been to the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but anyway, I digress and now I've lost my point. Yeah, how, how that felt stitching on my, my Kawandi in comparison to how it, I remember it feeling when I used to hand quilt with wadding. I don't use wadding anymore because it would involve buying it new. Um, so I, I might use... If I make a, a, a quilt of any kind, I usually nowadays just do two layers. So I have my... but my, my top layer is more than one layer, if you see what I mean, because it's invariably... We're going to do it. We're going to do it next year. If you missed that on the second part of the Manx Log Cabin I'd said it again, the Manx quilt on Wonky Wednesday. Um, uh, next year's stitch along, because we're past the quarter way mark now, so I have to start thinking about next year, because I'm sure you, you know, you will want want something next year. I don't hope, I hope you don't all just abandon me on the 31st of December and say, well, thanks very much, KVN, that was lovely. Um, have a nice life. No, I hope that's not happening. So, yeah, I have already begun to give some thought to what we might do next year, and it seems to be a popular idea, at least amongst the, the Wonky Wednesday people, to make an actual quilt. So, yeah, let me just talk a little bit about that. I don't want to frighten anybody who hasn't made a quilt before. It won't be scary, it will be fun, I promise. And also I will try and, or I will design it in such a way that you don't have to make a quilt if you don't want to. If you just want to follow the project and make individual pieces and make them into something else, then I will factor that in. Um, but the concept I'm thinking of, don't quote me because it might change, um, is to make some kind of modular um, project so that we'll work, they'll, they'll probably will, or almost certainly there will still be a weekly video, but we might not make a whole module in each week. We might, you know, make an aspect of a module, if that makes any sense. And then the pieces will be joined together in, we're not gonna make a top and then put wadding and backing and hand quilt, a great big whole quilt. No, we're not doing that, definitely not. We will do all the work in modules and then we will join the modules together for those that want to join the modules together. Those that don't, I don't know why I keep saying modules, I can't think of another word. Those that don't could take the individual pieces, let's call them, and turn them into something else like a cushion or a bag or, you know, a pouch or a scroll or whatever, whatever. So I'll try and come up with something along those lines. As long as you promise you're not all going to abandon me on the 31st of December or whatever the last Monday is of 2024. Because I've kind of got used to you all being around. So that would make me very sad. Okay. Okay, my she-wolf. You're just coming along on your back and then you're ready to have your little lunar eclipse cloth laid over you. So just to recap while I finish these last few stitches, the themes for the, well, our, our concept for this week is the moon and um, the idea that it 
that we, we look at the same moon. And I, when I say that, I know there's only one moon, like I said, but I mean the, the same phase of the moon, wherever we are on the planet. Um, but we've just had uh, the full moon, which, did I say that in, in um, Down Under, for want of... I don't like to just say Australia and New Zealand, because there are other peoples down there as well, other countries. Um, but, you know, in the Southern Hemisphere, let's call it that. Let's call it what it is. It will be. A, it was a harvest moon, because it's autumn there. Um, whereas here, though it's the same moon, I think we've established that, um, it's not a harvest moon. It's known as a worm moon by some people, which is to do with the spring and the worms moving in the soil. And worms may also mean the insect larvae, you know, coming out of hibernation and so on. But it's the same moon. So it's it's about that, really. You know, it's the same moon, but it's it might be there might be slight differences. I love the idea that we see the mirror image when it's in crescent. Um, sorry, it's a bit a bit even more whiff, whiff, whiffly and what, no, wittery and waffly than usual. Um, so here comes the book. Oh, I wanted to put my bit of cloth on as well. Um, also because of the friendship stars, I wanted to kind of underline that. I'll just show you mine again. Underline that, that wonderful thing that came out of the Friendship Star project by doing the moon. Um, and because of its connections to Easter, because I didn't want anybody to be disappointed. I could fully imagine that many of you were expecting some kind of Easter theme. Um, and uh, then I just got to thinking about my former moon moon pieces and I remembered my, my wolf, so there we go. So obviously I'm going to have to lay it so the book has to be turned because she's going landscape. Um, there's a very good friend of mine, I don't know if she's watching, but she knows who she is, um, who doesn't like that in a book. She likes a book to be either one way or the other and she made the mistake of saying it to me once and now I'm probably a bit mean because I keep going on about it and so probably I should stop. Uh, right, so I've got my bit of chiffon. I'm just going to tear a bit, hopefully. And I'm thinking I might sew it to this and to the page all in one. It might all go horribly wrong, but that's the idea. And it tears nicely, that's already something. I don't think even Gloria's mic could hear that tearing, it was so gentle. So, I don't mind that it's crumply. You know me, I'm certainly not going to iron it. Um, so I've got my bit of black. Where's it gone? There it is. A bit of black thread. In my needle. I might double it actually because it's quite fine. I hope it doesn't. Sometimes if you put your thread through single and then knot the two ends together, it it goes uneven in your stitch. You know, one, one strand gets pulled more tightly than the other and but I think for this little short length, I'll get away with it. I hope I will anyway. So now I'm going to have to stitch it really close to the spine, which is going to be every shade of awkward. First I need, of course... Oh, thank you so much to the person who posted in the Facebook group an episode of, of Gilmore Girls, which is a series that I've watched with my daughter um, more than once. Um, because there's an episode when Lorelei... If you don't know the Gilmore Girls, you won't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, when um, Lorelai is shopping with her dad for stationery and she picks up a box of giant paper clips. I can't get it on there. So I'm at a strange angle. And he says something like, why on earth would someone need giant paper clips? I don't remember the episode. Um, Probably I wasn't into the giant paper clips when I watched it, so it didn't, you know, resonate loudly enough in my brain. But I very much want to go and look it up. Right, because as we all know, everybody needs giant paper clips. And Lorelei's dad didn't know what he was talking about. Right. How am I going to be able to get my knot to stay in this very fine and slightly tricksy cloth? That'll do pig. Right. Now, excuse me if my head comes in. I think I just have to 
otherwise I'm not going to be able to do it. Do make sure there's only one page. I think I always say it, but... Oops. Oh yes, this is very awkward. It would have been easier to sew it to the outer edge, but I wanted my wolf to be facing that way. So I shall persevere. And if it goes a bit wobbly in the process, then so be it. It's a very big stitch and it's going to look very bad on the back, but... Um, talking of backs, we're going to do a piece one week about the back of work. There are many issues around the other side of your work. Um, one issue that I always had with my needlework teacher, and I know I'm not the only one, is this idea that the back of one's work, even if it will never be seen, should be as neat as the front. Well, you probably know, I'm going to have to stab stitch, you probably know what I think about that. Um, I do appreciate, by the way, that needlework teachers are teaching us what they believe is the proper way. Um, but at the same time, I've always been something of a rebel. <laughs> and I was probably the bane of my particular needlework teacher's life. She was called Mrs. Taverner. Um, because I was always the awkward one that said, when she told us to do something, why? Um, and to be honest, I don't think she always knew why. <laughs> probably why she didn't like me very much. Anyway. Um, yeah, the backs of things. Because to me, the back of something is not something that should be stressed about if it's going to be hidden. Because why? <laughs> Why, why, why? There are some things that people will tell you, like seams in proper quilting, you know, conventional, nice, nice machine piecing where everything's straight and all your points are good and all that stuff that I used to do. You do see in the surface of the cloth how your seam is arranged, if that worries you, you know? Well, that's not straight at all, but that's not worrying me. Um, you do see if your seam is pressed to one side or pressed open or it's got ruckled up halfway or whatever. You, that can be noticeable in the surface of the cloth. So if that's important to you, then obviously you need to take care of that. But that being said, if it's not important to you, I don't believe that we should be being made to feel that it should be. <laughs> Those of us who don't mind about such things. But the other much more important thing for me about the back of the work in the concept of slow stitch, in the ethos of slow stitch, is that it shows the journey, it shows the process, it shows the path you've taken across the cloth with your needle much more clearly than the top of the work does. Because you might be stitching over here and then want to do something over here, and then you, on the back you might just hop across rather than finishing off and starting again. You know, if you're naughty like me and didn't listen to Mrs. Taverner when she told you that you mustn't do that. Um, so, because slow stitch is the process, it's like, you know, estate agents will say, or real estate agents, I believe you might call them elsewhere, that there's only three things that are important when you're buying a property, and that is location, location, and location. With slow stitch, there are only three things that are important, and that is process, process, process. So seeing your stitching on the back shows the process, it shows the journey, shows all the decisions that you made while you were working. Um, so do expect one week um, something along those lines. Right, now I need to write my words about my wolf. So I do need to now find her again. Talk amongst yourselves. I marked the page and everything, and I've lost it. Um, flicking through, flicking through. Probably you'd rather I flicked through where you could see me flicking through. There she is. And the words weren't even there, were they? Nope, the words were in another book. <laughs> oh, it's chaotic here today. And I have marked them, so it's not that chaotic. Right, so I'm going to get my pencil. 
And I'm going to, this was over five years ago when I wrote this originally. Excuse me, I'm waving my arms about. Um, it's not a very dark pencil, the other one, so you can see. Here we go. Whoops. Wolf. Why do you howl at the moon? I'm going to give Moon a capital M just because I think she deserves it. And I'm calling her a she. Ask the sun. Speech marks, ask the sun. I might call the sun she as well just to be really subversive. <laughs> Sorry, I've been reading my pocket book, a book about pockets and pockets in women's clothes. Anyway, that would be a major digression. I won't start talking about that now. Expect more on pockets in the not too distant future. Her light moves me. See, I assign the moon feminine here. Her light moves me. I replied the wolf. I think I'm going to give wolf a capital W as well. I just feel in the mood for capitalising everything. Although I didn't in my original. But she has no light. Said the sun. Dot, dot, dot. Speech marks open. She only reflects mine. Reflects mine. There we go. Oh, said the wolf. And then we write it as a howl. Oh, oh. And then three, what did I do? Three O's and three H's. Three O's and three H's. Oh, oh, oh. Howling. Okay, so K3N Kiss. Sign it up here. Get rid of that monster. And it's the 1st of April. And this was not a fool. I didn't talk anymore about April Fools. Briefly, I'm ambivalent about April Fools. On the one hand, it's a bit of fun and all that. And on the other hand, I think it can be a bit mean. That, in a nutshell, is what I feel about April Fools. So, anyway, we're just calling it the 1st of April. 01, 04, 2024. Whoops. And I nearly went off the edge of the page, but we're good. Okay, so there's my she-wolf. Come back, she-wolf. There's my she-wolf. Behind her... Um, lunar eclipse running across the moon and then underneath her is my little let's borrow Maria's term if you've seen the um, video last Friday of my friend Maria's exhibition and call it a pen portrait I think that's right finally anyway I hope you enjoyed that um, thank you so much for watching and I look forward to you joining me next time for more cloth tales. Happy stitching. Bye bye.